Welcome to Healing Lives with Corey Gilbert, a podcast sponsored by the Healing Lives Center. Discover how to love and lead your family well and biblically. God created sex, marriage, and the family for our stewardship, growth, and benefit. My heart and passion is to teach, train, educate, and disciple Christians that want strong marriages and families. The Healing Lives Center has been serving Christians since the year 2000. Its mission is to be a center for sex, trauma, and marriage education and transformation, where we offer counseling, coaching, courses, and speaking services to you, your church, or ministry. Check us out at HealingLives.com. Yeah, tonight we're going to focus on technology a little bit, yes, but also the areas that's deep and dear to my heart is a biblical sexual ethic. Uh, we have a mess. And so we're going to start this week. I think I'm coming next week, next Monday as well. We'll continue next week. What I want to do next week is actually address more of where you're at. Like, so questions we might have come up, uh, those kind of things. So we can kind of really, what is a game plan next week? What do I do? But today we're going to kind of introduce that. Uh, these are a number of years ago to my boys, uh, my two boys. We were skiing and I think it was 2017. We were skiing at Mount uh, at Hoodoo and it was the last day of the season. And my middle son, his name is Blaze, bright red hair. We picked the name well, but he has no filter. He walked up to some girls that were wearing um, sports bras. It's kind of a warm day, and he's like, why are they wearing that? And I was like, oh, gosh. And the guys were like, well, because they're hot. He looked confused. <laughs> I was kind of hot, because he that, was at the age of not quite sure. So I was like, okay, i got some conversations to have, because it's not your business what they're wearing, blah, blah, blah. Well, about an hour later, where luckily Blaze was a little bit further away, but... Alex and I were going down this run, and this girl comes flying past us, topless. I'm like, oh, great. I gotta go deal with that now. So I chase after Alex and get to the bottom of the hill, and I'm right there with Alex, and he's just wide eyed. <laughs> I was like, first time? <laughs> yes. I was like, how did you like this guy, brother? <laughs> and we've had a hundred conversations since then. Because um, we've talked about pornography in our house since they were little. We also kind of wonder, so w- when are they going to open that door? Do I sit down and show them? No. But it's like somewhere they're going to open that door. They're going to see things that is, that's confusing. And most of, the, most of the stories I hear is the first time I saw something, I was either disgusted, in shock, and whatever that first emotion was, it was followed by curiosity. I want to, but then where does it go? Secrecy and darkness, where Satan has a heyday. So shortly after this, I took my kids to see this movie, Ready Player One. Three kids. Um, so they're, what, probably 10, or 12, 10, and I think Miley was 8. And there's a scene in the movie that was very uncomfortable for me as a dad sitting there with my kids. Um, and this... This, they're in the cyber world. They're you know they're in fake world, online, virtual world. And this girl comes out and she's in this very sleek dress. So afterwards, I said, "Okay, Alex, what, what was your response to that?" And he was like, "I was uncomfortable. Just I wasn't sure what to think." Blaze, he didn't care. He was focused on at the end when the guy gets kicked in the crotch, and he just thought that was the most hilarious thing in the world. That's that's my middle middle guy. And Miley, he was. Oh, Beautiful dress. She was focused on that. See how how everything that we even do and experience, we see it through a different lens, including us. We don't know where they're at unless we ask them. And so there's this problem that we have, and it's this cyberspace. It's a whole new world, and it's a place. So just kind of a something that I'll say more later about, but what I'm seeing in families as a therapist and counselor, coaching families, working with families is I've raised them well, I've raised them in church, I've done this and that and the other, but yet what's coming into our houses, in their bedroom or right there in the living room or sitting at the kitchen table online is changing their world right in front of us. And as people, we never would have let let sit in our living room most likely, not to mention that they'll never meet ever, ever. But it's changing our kids. And so this cyberspace is an actual place. We need to think about that, of it that way. 
Because for them it is. For them, the experience of online is something that many of us can't even comprehend. Why would I choose to keep playing a game when I can go play with real people? And that's a dilemma for many. That's a struggle for many. Um, but we've done something, we've taken it a step further. Normalization of a fetish. We've taken something that possibly could have gone, been okay or good, and we've taken it too far. How? Um, politicians and their stories. We're consuming people. We like it actually when people fall, which I think is kind of scary. Fifty Shades of Grey, that whole um, abuse of power and basically abuse all the way through. I was standing in line one time with my, I think it was my oldest to, to see a Lego movie. And three ladies standing in front of me waiting in line to watch Fifty Shades of Grey at my age. Like why we watch that with friends, that's just creepy in and of itself. But what's the target? It was the 40 something year old discontented wife woman. That's who that target was. Funny thing is, so was Twilight. Twilight was targeting that same demographic and bring your team to introduce something, to, to push the envelope just a little bit. But then we have cyber socialization. The fact is our kids are online all the time and they communicate that way. And we struggle with that with our kids. What is that boundary? When, it, when kids at you know, um, school or at um, youth group have a device and they don't, that's a problem. I don't think it's a bad problem necessarily, but it becomes a problem. So how do you navigate that? But cyber exhibitionism, what is that? Sexting, showing off our body, TikTok. Like what we have online I almost wish we could go back to just some magazines with some naked pictures. Sad to say that. Because our kids aren't consuming that. They're not going to Google and typing in boobies or something. They're watching graphic video. Usually from the beginning. And from what age? Seven, eight. It gets introduced somewhere, something piques their interest, something happens to them, that's when that, op that door gets open. And so then we have the webcams and the cyber voyeurs that we love to watch, we love to peek in. This isn't new, but it's different. It's different than most any of us in the world we grew up in and um, the, thing that, the way that we experience the world. Same for this. What's normal? Like, I miss going to even the dentist and sitting in the waiting room and talking to people. <laughs> Can't do that anymore. You get in trouble <laughs> by someone. Like, everyone's on their device. We're sometimes the worst ones. We're not necessarily handling this well. And then we want our kids to steward something that we're not handling well. That, that's, that's a problem. And what does this become? Well, it's a slot machine. It is designed that way. Go to Netflix and watch Social Dilemma. It's a great documentary. It's scary. And it's people who've left the tech industry and some who are still in it, but a lot of them have left. Um, like the guy who invented the like button. He's like, I thought I was doing something great for the world, and it's, I didn't realize I was creating monsters. And now almost all of them will not let their kids have iPads or smartphones or anything, which I think is actually kind of interesting. And we do. We tend to. So we create this, I have to have more, I have to have more, I have to have more. And if you think of even how the algorithms work and how the, the system works, is if you post something that keeps you on the thing, it's going to be seen more than if you post something that has any click out. They want you to stay on their platform, whichever one that is that you're consuming. Uh, they want you to stay. And so what is it doing? It's designed to create addicts. And again, some of us are the worst. I love that I can be sitting here, and, and I was at a conference in Nashville last week, I spoke there, and then in all these sessions. I love it when a speaker mentions a book, I can have it at home when I get home, practically. <laughs> and I did. I found a speaker who said something, whoop, it's click, 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 boom, and it's there in a day or two. It's kind of cool, and also kind of scary. Um, so, what do we do with this?
let's define addiction here. It's a condition in which a person engages in use of a substance or in a behavior which the rewarding effects provide a compelling incentive to repeatedly pursue the behavior despite detrimental consequences. I'm not a fan of the word addiction because I think we use the word almost too much in some ways. But it's the idea of something else is in charge of me. Now think of your team, if you have a team. That would be all of them. There's something else in charge of them to some extent. A certain friend that matters more, a certain opinion of someone, a certain thing they desire, a certain thing that they're focused on. Ironically, it's the same kind of thing that I think God uses to guide us places, to create talent and skill and like good things happen here. So it's where we have to be careful that we don't just all technology is bad, because it's not. It's an incredible tool. This book here, The Cyber Effect, so it's an expert of cyber psychology, explains how technology is shaping our children, our behavior, and our values, and what we can do about it. Talks about toddlers and tablets. Up till about age two especially, it's an absolute no when it comes to screens, in terms of what it does to the brain. But then after that, what does it do? Well, it depends on how much. It depends on what we, how, how we're consuming, what's happening in preschool and literacy. I mean, they're more capable online or on a computer than sometimes even we are by kindergarten and first grade. I remember I set up this Mac Mini in our back room in Georgia, Georgia, and the kids were complaining at how slow it was. And I'm like, how do you know? And then I found out they were messing with mom's laptop. It's like, they should not know that that's slow. <laughs> it was so annoying, because I thought that there was a boundary there that her laptop was just for her. Um, but what I often didn't find is families who had great boundaries and had great um, rules, the kids got around that somewhere through um, an old iPad or grandma's iPad or um, an old Nintendo DS, some you know, devices we never thought of. And one kid, it was through a Kindle White, able to access what? It's text, so what do they access? What's text form of this stuff? Erotica, stories, fan fiction. And for this person, it was um, the fantasy of wow, what would it be like to wake up and be a girl? Not transgenderism, just that's a fantasy that's actually too normal. It's kind of scary, but when you have a place to go with it, it's really scary. As in the text and the stories and the. Um, it, it's a, a random thought that could be passed over really quickly. There's a lot of those. So there's these devices. I know you've, you know what they are. Um, this is what I call them. To me, this is called a form portal. Unless there's controls, and I'll talk about that later, but unless there's controls, you're handing your child something that I can go swipe, I can click on Safari, and it takes two more clicks and I'm looking at porn. If I type in porn, what shows up? We're on the Wi-Fi in the church, let's see. <laughs> what shows up, you know? It's text. So we're not there yet. All I type in is porn. Porn and other stuff. I click on images or video and my life's never the same. That goes for every one of us. So it goes for our kids. Why wouldn't they go there? Or pregnancy, or some other just curious thing that they're interested in learning about. Something that came up at school, something that a friend said. Like that's how we've got the stewardship of this is so critical. And how do we manage that? I've dealt with men for years that have porn addictions and, and um, women as well. And it's funny how some of these smartphones are actually better because you can lock some of them down. Um, so there's different, definitely improvements in, in terms of some of that. Um, but if a person's going to get around it, they're going to get around it. Teen, adult, doesn't matter. 
Our family, we never had a filter on anything in our house, ever. It's wide open, it's a conversation at the dinner table almost every day, every time we're at the table, about something. Um, when, since they were one, two, three, it's a culture of, we're gonna talk about this, we're gonna go there, because the norm <laughs> is this. So it's been interesting to watch kids that I've actually even, mine but others, I've had influence over, when they get together with people, do they have their phone out or are they not? Because that relationship with your phone actually is kind of scary. I love that our youth group at our church, uh, Salem Fifth Baptist, when they go on a retreat, they collect all the phones and lock them in a lockbox. Every time. Well, if there are some kids that will not go on retreat, why? I'm not leaving my phone. It's, it's my baby. Like they, they will have a panic attack. We need help, we need counsel, we need some um, some help big time. Biggest influence I mentioned a minute ago, online friends. What our kids are doing online matters. Some of us may not be very tech savvy, we need to get some help. We need to find other people, other friends to, to stay in front of this. Uh, we are not meant to stay behind this. We're just hoping to catch things. We need to be proactive. Some of you who are tech savvy, you can, it, it's actually fun. It's a nice little hunt sometimes. Um, I remember the, the first time one of our kids looked up something and um, we were able to catch it. We didn't have any system that shows. We were able to catch it and have a conversation. And it was a conversation, not shame on you. And like, what you say matters, and how you go about this matters, and how you draw them towards Christ, and towards redemption, and towards hope, and towards, hey, this is going to be a struggle. Now that you've opened this door, there's now a temptation to go back there. So be, be wise, be smart. Um, my, one of my kids just got a phone, and I was gone on my on a kind of conference. So he set up the Apple ID, couldn't get it set up with the one we had tied to our family where I could lock it down. This was just last week. Um, so he set it up with a different one, but then he was scared of his own temptation to stuff. He's 15. So he locked put parental controls on it himself. I was like, oh, I'm cute. <laughs> um, and then he's always slides it under our door at night and it stays in our room at night and that kind of stuff, even though it locks at midnight. But, um, there's stuff that we can do, but there's some, some of, of this, there's some pieces that deeply influence us. What is stunting their growth? We have a problem today, specifically a problem with boys that are not becoming men. The research on this is horrifying, which means every one of us in this room are absolutely key, pivotal. Whether as a parent, first of all, but also potentially an influence on other kids because we do Boy Scouts, my oldest son just finished the Eagle Project a few weeks ago, and uh, we've done that for what, 12 years now since he was first grade, and um, I never would have chosen to do that, but my dad did it, and skipped me, because we lived in South America, and first grader, I decided, to, hey, let's give it a try. What's been neat is, these are men that I trust, so our Boy Scout troop is dads at our church, and I'm an influence on their sons, and they're an influence on my sons. It's, it's, it's a setup, by the way. <laughs> and my daughter does American Heritage Girls with my wife, and it's a setup. It's other moms that my daughter could go to while my wife is ministering and loving on and leading other girls. It's probably why you picked the school, too. It's a setup. It needs to be at least. We need to think about it that way. It's setting up relationships to protect. But knowing that not everyone is safe, so not to be naive. So what is stunting our growth? Well, the number one I've said is porn. What's happening to our kids is that is taking them. That's normal. If you go to almost any sex therapist, you as a couple, they will suggest to you to watch porn to enhance your sex life. Run. It's no. It's clear violation of scripture. Not even a question. No. Which also means you need to know scripture to know where the boundaries of some of this are. 
Uh, one of our friends said in West Salem that they, the norm that he had heard last spring in, in, among a lot of teenagers was, oh, my parents are a part of a trouble. So there's usually like husband and wife and she's got a girlfriend or he's got a girlfriend. Some polyamory. Three, four, five, six different people that all live together and there's some variation of sexual sadness. Um, go to YouTube and yeah, you can do this, it's okay. And type in polyamory and listen to some of the stories. I've never heard one where they didn't say it in their own words in the story why it doesn't work. Because anything that's outside of God's design will not work. It will fall, fail. Not that every heterosexual marriage works either. Like we are sinners, but it's way better off because uh, we're closer to God's design. We'll look at that next week too. Second one though is excessive video game play. And some of you right now are like, "Yes, I told you so." <laughs> now let me give a caveat. We have an Xbox room. So we have a room with multiple TVs and multiple Xboxes. I'm not anti. <laughs> uh, and, we, and it's had many, many iterations from, from the Wii and stuff we did as a family to multiple Xboxes where they were playing together to now they're all online, but playing together. And it's been annoying. I feel like I have to have a doctorate to manage the stupid parental controls. And I actually gave up on them a couple years ago. I was so tired of them, but especially once they figure out the password. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. I thought like they made it that way on purpose. But it's multiple, it's millions actually, it feels like conversations and boundaries. Because my daughter would be playing, and he's like, well, but I can't say no to someone who has to be my friend online, that's mean. I get your heart, but no, <laughs> boundary. And so, at least our rule has been, you have to have seen them in person in the last two weeks to play with them. They, they have to be someone that we know. Um, so it's actually a lot of our Boy Scout friends or other um, church friends that they just live across the city or something like that. Um, but you have to have a plan. That's the thing. Because what is excessive alien play? <laughs> Wearing diapers? And playing for 20 plus hours? <laughs> This is my whole world. Nothing interferes with this. I won't go to school. I won't interact with humans. That's what, that's what this is talking about. This is research from Zimbardo. Um, so it's these three. Porn, excessive video game pit play, and then absent fathers. Dad can be there, but if he's not there, there's an impact. If he's absent, that's another whole mess, which is part of why we've done Boy Scouts. I've told single moms, we are glad to have your son and you're not invited. <laughs> no, thank you. And we've, it's been awesome to help love on those boys and, and uh, raise them up and encourage them and be there during the hard times and things like that. That's the body of Christ. Because remember this, as much as I love my wife of 20 years, I can't believe it, 20 years, it's awesome. Of uh, 20 years, I've been married to this amazing woman. When we go to heaven, marriage doesn't go with us. But what does? The second institution that God created called the church. The body of Christ does. We need one another. If you don't know people in here, you need to know them. If you don't know others in the community that you can have help surround your son and daughter, that's why we're here. That's why we need our brothers and sisters in Christ. Absent fathers, there's some dad, there was, there's trauma in my oldest kid because of my absence. Because I was bedridden. When Kelly and I got married, I was walking with a cane and told I'd never have a job. And our first many years, I was in and out of hospitals. And yeah, when he was little, I didn't come home from teaching a class and I'm on a couch and I can't get off the couch. I'm crying, he's crying. There's some trauma there, there's some hurt there. It affects a kid when dad's not present, when dad won't engage. But here's the scary one. Um, and for most of us dads, it's too late for this one, so we encourage the next generation. But birth to seven is the most critical time. So not when they're ready to play ball. It's when they're in diapers. It's when they're little. They're being shaped by the dad. 
And my wife jokingly, when our kids turned 18 months, she was like, all right, I'm done, they're all yours. Because <laughs> Dobson was saying, at 18 months, the kid switches from mom to dad in terms of attachment. So she was done. Just kidding. Um, yeah. Another one, though, is fear responsibility. Our kids don't know how to have responsibility if they're not careful. Our own kids. So how do we teach that? How do we encourage that? Especially when they go, well, my friends don't have to do chores, and my friends this, and my friends that. You know, and that's, you're going to hear that. You've probably heard that many times. Mm-hmm. How to teach them practical skills. There's a really cool YouTube guy right now teaching um, people that didn't have someone to teach them these things, like practical skills, how to fix a doorknob, how to, you know, it's such a cool idea. I'm jealous, which I thought about. Because um, I raised, our kids kind of were raised in a house built in 1993 in Georgia, where I was restoring that house. And so, you know, to help teach them and then help out. And my 13 year old was so proud of herself helping change the oil for our road trip this summer. And, now I was like, Mom, I need to check the oil in your car. And <laughs> um, every time I've changed the brakes or radiator or anything, it's the boys <coughs> they hate me for it. I hated my dad for it. So thankful for it. Like the skills that they can learn are so, so critical. And then skillless is another one. That we need to be teaching these things, practical things. They can teach us stuff too, because there's things about our computer even that they might know that, that we don't, that our technology, great, learn. I actually often, for my kids, like, oh, I didn't know that phone could do that. Thanks for showing me that trick around something that smack. <laughs> um, I've also had twice traveling to speak at a parenting event, and my son is doing something he shouldn't with a phone, and it's usually texting a girl that he's trying to rescue self-harm or something else and not telling an adult. And we've had to intervene and go, gosh, and so thanks for giving me more to share <laughs> things that I talk to people about. Um, and, if, and one of those, we were at a campground somewhere and he, my wife said, let me see your phone. And he said, no. And I jumped up. Not that he's bigger than me, but it's like walk. And so we started walking and Two or three laps around, he finally hands it to me and fesses up that I didn't do anything wrong. He was just scared for her. His heart was actually in the right place. I had to get there carefully. And it's hard to know. And we each have different personalities. Some of us are going to be more aggressive, and some of us are going to be way more passive. Yeah. Um, so if I try to make my wife who's more passive be aggressive, how's that going to work? It's not going to go well. So we each have personalities that we need to learn to use as assets, knowing that even that same thing can be a liability. And then the one you know for sure that's really affecting us, our kids, is social media. If I could say one thing that's an absolute no until they're 30, (laughs) 18 plus, is social media. There's no need for it. But there's such a need for it to them. I'm missing out on what everyone's communicating on Discord. Everyone's communicating on sorry. They have a group on Instagram. They have a group. Sorry. That, that's been a hard one. I don't, I don't know about you. It's been a hard one for us to know where to say no and when to, how to guide them that this is a tool that I don't trust you to manage at this point, even though you hate me. That's difficult. And I promise I've had tears, I've had angst over where's this boundary with some of these things. And I, I call my kids my experiments, so I've got three, we'll see. But, um, but then conversation with parents and working with families that are dealing with a kid who's acting out or doing harm or um, someone who's been harmed. Because where, where does a lot of this ideas even come for, and I'm going to make a stereotype here, but that teenage boy who harms a girl. Yes, it goes, girls do, can do the harm too. Where does, he doesn't just come up with it out of thin air. And the irony is, one of the key places is the graphic, graphic porn he watches, he consumes, the ideas, where it objectifies. There is no intimacy. There is no relationship. 
we're basically animals. So how to help instill in our sons and our daughters a biblical sexual ethic is critical. Grounding in that. Another piece of that biblical sexual ethic, I would say, is actually a biblical view of marriage. Tim Keller, in his book, The Meaning of Marriage, the reason why he wrote the book was his church was predominantly single in New York. And he's like, this isn't okay. Because not, no, not all of you are called to be married, but more of you are than you realize. But you're afraid of it. It's scary. It's, you have to everyone kind of out of an arm's length. And so an invitation to a biblical theology of marriage. Why marriage? Why is marriage one man and one woman for life? No other combinations. Why? Without a defense. And if we're careful, we go back to Scripture and go, well, there was polygamy and polyamory and and there's incest and there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah, those weren't the examples. (laughs) Those were not do this. God's design was perfect. And sin messed it up. Thank you for tuning in to the Healing Lives with Corey Gilbert podcast. It has been an honor to serve. If you are struggling, have questions, or in need, Dr. Gilbert offers a free consultation for new clients. Check us out at healinglives.com to book a call. If this has been helpful to you, please share it, leave a review, and help us get the word out so that we can see lives changed, marriages transformed, and more people come into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. The Healing Life Center offers online courses, programs, books, intensives, and other services to help you live biblically and well. Discover more resources on YouTube and in Dr. Gilbert's Healing Marriage Facebook group, The Healing Marriage.